Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy to have you with us today. My name is Linda Williams. I am a community outreach and training manager with uh, Consumer Action. I uh, just really want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar on fair housing in the COVID-19 era. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that Consumer Action will be hosting in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So mark your calendar for some upcoming webinars in July, specifically July 15th on COVID-19 stamps and care fraud. And this one we have, we will have uh, David Godfrey from the American Bar Association. He's, he's going to give a presentation on uh, advanced health care directive in a COVID-19 environment. Before we get started today, I have a few housekeeping tips for you. You can use the question prompt to uh, ask your questions. My coworker, Nelson Santiago, will be monitoring your questions. And at the end of the presentation today, he'll do his best to get your questions to our guest speakers. You can also ask your questions on Twitter. Consumer Action's handle is at Consumer Action, and you can use the hashtag CA Webinars to ask your question. The webinar is being recorded. All of the handouts will be placed in the Dropbox and made available to you after the webinar. Consumer Action has created a great fact sheet on uh, fair housing in the COVID-19 era. Please uh, go to uh, our website at www.consumer-action.org after the webinar and download a copy. Now, at the end of the webinar, you, you will receive a survey. And surveys are extremely important to us, so please, please, please complete um, the survey and return it um, to us as soon as possible. Now, before I introduce the guest speakers, let me tell you a little bit about what we do at Consumer Action. Consumer Action is a national nonprofit. Consumer Action is RCA. We enjoy a national reputation for creating uh, multilingual consumer education materials in the field of credit, banking, privacy, housing, insurance, and utilities. All of those kitchen table, pocket books, and you your family, your neighbors, and the communities that you serve. serve. And in this strange COVID-19 era, budgeting, maintaining your good credit, protecting your privacy, and if you have insurance, keeping that insurance is just so extremely important. We are a 501c3 organization, and like most nonprofits, we are supported by grants and donations. So for $25 a year, you can become a member of Consumer Action and it will help us to continue some of our work. Now, let me give you an overview of today's uh, webinar. As you can see, as you can see uh, on the screen, our first topic is for the day is fair housing in the COVID-19 era. And our pres presenter is Chancellor Armand Shore. Uh, our second topic is uh, tips and resources for taking care of your mental health in the COVID-19 era. And Dr. Jessica Roberts is our presenter. So before I introduce the guest speakers, let me take just a couple of seconds to tell you a little bit about their background. Uh, Chancellor Armand Shure is someone I've known since she was and admired since she was a staff attorney at Neighborhood Legal Services, where she spent 16 years. During her tenure at NLS, she supervised a homeless prevention project for Los Angeles City and Los Angeles County, litigating hundreds of cases involving landlord tenant, the subsidized housing program, mortgage fraud, and discrimination in housing. She is a board member of the National Fair Housing Alliance and the California Reinvestment Coalition. She's a member of the Black Women's Lawyers Association of Los Angeles. She has received numerous awards for her work, including one from the California Lawyers, uh, the Super Lawyers Award, the Los Angeles Pro Bono Service Award for her work with Katrina victims. And for the past 10 years, she served as the executive director of the Housing Rights Center, which is one of the largest and uh, oldest um, fair housing organizations. Now, Dr. Um, Jessica Roberts is a licensed psychologist. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from Concordia University in uh, Irvine, uh, California. She has a master's and a doctorate in for forensic psychology from Alliance and the National University in Fresno. Dr. Roberts has a diverse background, including inpatient and outpatient assessment, 
and treatment in uh, evaluations, individual, family, and group therapy and crisis response. Dr. Roberts has worked with adults, adolescents, families, individuals with um, intellectual di uh, disabilities, individuals with severe mental uh, illness, as well as incarcerated individuals. She currently serves uh, in an administrative role uh, as the Homeless School Service Partnership uh, uh, Liaison for the Department of Mental Health, uh, Housing and Job Development Division. That division is dedicated to helping those that are experiencing both severe mental illness and homelessness. Both of our guest speakers are subject matter experts and frontline advocates, and we're so honored to have them both with us. Uh, join us today. So without further ado, let me turn this webinar over to uh, Chancellor Almonshore. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I went a little bit too fast. My name is Chancellor Almonshore. I'm the executive director of the Housing Rights Center. We were founded in 1968, the same year that, the, that Congress passed the Fair Housing Act. Um, and we are the largest nonprofit civil rights organization, at least we think. Um, please email me separately if, if you think there's one um, bigger than ours, because I, I don't want to claim that if it's not correct. But one of the largest nonprofit civil rights organizations that's dedicated to securing and promoting fair housing. We've been doing this um, for since 1968, but in the last 10 years alone, we've served over 250,000 residents in terms of direct client services. And we have staff that offer a multitude of services and in a multitude of languages as well. And we provide counseling, investigations, education. We provide resources um, and also we provide a litigation of fair housing matters. So today we're going to cover, um, and I'm going to do an overview. I have about 30 minutes, and so those of you who uh, do any type of training uh, know that that's not much time to cover um, a, a lot of material. So it's really going to be an overview of the Fair Housing Act um, and a you know, discussion of how it protects consumers against housing discrimination. I'm also going to cover whether COVID-19 is a disability under the Fair Housing Act or um, under other uh, laws that protect persons with disabilities. I'm also going to uh, cover um, housing provider or landlord responsibilities under the Fair Housing Act. And in particular, with COVID-19 eviction protections and moratoriums throughout the country, I'm going to uh, not cover all of them. I clearly don't have enough time to do that. But I'm going to spend, at least I'm going to discuss what's happening in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. And I also have uh, the resources there for how you can get information about possible eviction moratoriums or bans or restrictions in your uh, state. Um, and then a quick thing about how you, how you can advise your tenants or persons who are having housing discrimination matters to file a complaint and assert their rights under the Fair Housing Act. And then we have resources as well for you. So um, in 1968, both of these pictures were taken. In both of these pictures were taken in April uh, 1968, um, less than two week period of time uh, between um, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and then <clears throat> after his assassination, um, President Lyndon B. Johnson and a very divided Congress, much as is divided today, signed and passed a Fair Housing Act very quickly. Um, the Fair Housing Act is considered to be one of the last great pieces of civil rights legislation. And that was passed you know, in 1968. Um, and you know, I, just, I, I, I do have to highlight for a moment as today, um, is the, the funeral and final resting of George Floyd um, that obviously, you know, this country and, and, and you know, and we're all affected um, in, in different ways by racism. Uh, at the Housing Rights Center, we and other organizations who I know are on this call, you've dedicated your life and your services to try to combat um, discrimination in particular racism and also in particular racism against Blacks. Um, and you know, so I just wanted to highlight that because you know there are a lot of there are a lot of articles. If you just kind of Google 1968 and 19 and 2020, there are a lot of um, similarities and some distinctions as well in terms of the time we're in and 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 where we are right now. Um, the pandemic at that time was the Vietnam War. Um, you know, so um, I you know encourage you to look at it because it, it's it's interesting to look at and it's a, a good and kind of insight into our history and how the Fair Housing Act was passed. Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, wanted to combat 
racism um, and in, in addition to that redlining and segregation um, and housing that was one of his missions um, and so um, that was one reason why it was decided that they so, so quickly moved to pass a, a, a strong fair housing act to prohibit illegal discrimination in housing Um, so the Fair Housing Act. So right now, this is basically I'm covering the federal Fair Housing Act protections. Um, I know that there are people from out throughout the country who are on this call. Um, I'm I practice in the state of California. Uh, so, um, but right now, these are the protections that should be covered uh, under uh, that they are covered under the federal act. So at the very least, um, you should have these protections, and hopefully, you have addition additional protections in your state or in your local jurisdiction. So the Fair Housing Act covers. Um, Dis, uh, discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, um, and in particular, um, I just have a couple of things here to, to really look at in terms of what is um, usually the cases of discrimination of religion. It usually has to do with posted signs and advertisements like Christmas displays or or um, some type of religious display of, of any religion um, on uh, doors or, or things like that where the management says you have to take them down or, or management insists you have to have them, something like that where there's um, differential treatment on the basis of religion. Um, the Fair Housing Act also covers sex. Um, this covers gender, sexual or uh, sexual harassment is covered under the sex under the Fair Housing Act. Um, and uh, just I just wanted to say this really quickly: sexual orientation is not covered under the Federal Fair Housing Act. It is covered under in many states, fortunately, but it's not covered under the Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act. Though. So, as great of legislation as it is, there's obviously a lot of work that still needs to be done. National origin is covered under the Fair Housing Act, um, where we see that in particular with monolingual, monolingual non-English signs and advertisements for rentals um, that are posted um, that would that prohibit a, a person who don't who doesn't um, who's influent in that language from being able to apply for that unit. Also, the Fair Housing Act covers discrimination on basis of familial status, um, which is basically um, families with children or expecting a child or a grandchild or a foster child, um, and and also it covers a disability, in particular mental disability and physical disability um, and reasonable accommodations, which I'm gonna get into a little bit more so because it's relevant to this webinar. Um, I am gonna talk just for a couple minutes about the California Fair Employment Housing Act because I know there are several people on this call from California, but also um, because I think it's helpful. I know I always benefit from knowing what categories are covered under in other states. Um, because you know California was slow, slow to the table um, with some of its protections. There were some states that protected, for example, um, Section 8 and, and other government subsidized vouchers from discrimination. California just adopted that as a protected category in, in, as just recently as January 1st of 2020. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, but just really quickly, in addition to the Federal Fair Housing Act, protected categories in California, we also cover ancestry, sexual orientation, um, source of income, Section 8, as I said before, um, third party, meaning that landlords can't refuse to accept third party payments uh, from, from a non-tenant for that unit. We also cover gender identity and gender expression, genetic information, medical condition, marital status, military and veteran status, which were, these categories actually were just added as of January 1st of 2020. I know a lot of states had um, covered military and veteran status um, earlier than that. And then in addition, we have other laws in California that um, protect persons who are the victims or survivors of domestic violence, so they can break a lease early and that type of thing if they um, if they need to. And uh, we also cover immigration and citizenship status, which I, I know is a protected category in California that um, many states um, don't have that that protected category. But in California, it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of immigration, uh, your immigration status. Um, also, primary language. If you negotiate your rental contract um, in, in a certain language. Um, in, and, and if it's in writing, and particularly that the owner has to provide you with materials um, in the language in which you negotiated your contract. Um, and uh, arbitrary reasons are covered, meaning a landlord can't discriminate against a tenant based on arbitrary reasons and race. And then we also have laws that prohibit hate crimes um, in California. Fair housing laws, I, I, I basically say, I think fair housing laws apply to almost everything <laughs> to some degree so um it, it's probably easier to whittle down what it doesn't apply to but it basically applies to a, a lot of different housing transactions from renting buying uh, lending to be able to, uh, for your your mortgage uh, for your home uh, prospective home seekers are covered um, there are cases of um, against insurance companies under that have been um, bought bought successfully under the fair housing act for discriminating against um, the housing providers that they insure 
Um, so um, um, basically it, it can it applies to a lot of different housing transactions. It also applies to a lot of different residential units, as you see here, Con apartments, condos, houses, duplexes, residential motels, transitional shelters, mobile home parks, vacant lots, and short-term rentals. Now, let me take a step back. Um, as I'm saying this, uh, some of these may only be in California. Um, so, uh, so you should check your, your local jurisdiction to see if your local jurisdiction has some of these additional protections and has the fair housing laws, um, in particular when it comes to like things such as um, well, I, I, I think there's an argument to be made that most of these are still should still be covered in, uh, under your state. So I'm just going to leave it like that. <laughs> uh, the prohibited practices under the fair housing law, it is illegal for uh, the housing provider. And when I say housing provider, I mean everybody who's involved in, in the rental or sale um, or provision of housing, rental housing services. So that could include uh, management, include maintenance as well. Um, but it is illegal for them to discriminate against you or to um, provide uh, different terms uh, in, a, in housing. It's a, illegal to refuse to sell, to rent, to negotiate, to say that the housing is unavailable when it's not. Um, so that's usually like, you know, you call by, no, it's not available. You drive by, see a list posted later, clearly it's still available. That's uh, prohibited. Uh, using differential terms or rules, a refusal to grant a reasonable accommodation and or modification for a person with disability. And that's in my next slides, I'm gonna get into a little bit more. So discrimination based on association is, is, uh, per, is prohibited as well as steering, meaning steering um, persons to a certain neighborhood or a certain part of a building. Um, uh, based on their membership in a protected category, that's illegal. Discriminatory statements and advertisement is illegal almost always, um, even if in your, like in California, for example, if, if there is a property that is um, for some reason, for whatever reason, it may be exempt under the Fair Housing Act or other laws, maybe because it's a single family home, what's always covered um, or always prohibited under the Fair Housing Act are discriminatory statements and advertising. And it's otherwise uh, prohibited to make housing unavailable. Okay, so it takes, there's a delay here on, on advancing slides, I'm sorry. So I'm going to get right to COVID-19 right now. So number one, um, going back to what I just discussed, it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of race, national origin, and ethnicity. It's illegal to discriminate on the basis of a physical or mental disability, including a perceived disability. Um, and COVID-19 is, is infection. It's considered to be a disability requiring protection from dis discrimination and landlord duty to provide a reasonable accommodation. So how I kind of reach um, that conclusion, because as far as I know, there hasn't been case law. I think uh, all the courts in California um, are currently closed. So there, not that the case could have been brought this quickly and come to court and litigated and discovery and everything else, but say, you know, for whatever reason, um, it, it hasn't happened yet. So you don't have any clear legal um, definition or legal precedent to say that COVID-19 is um, infection is uh, considered to be a disability. And as a matter of fact, in doing research um, for today, I, I found a lot of discussion from different persons that said that because it should, it's considered, it can be a short-term illness and it is not something that substantially limits or impairs one's major life activities, which is the definition um, of dis disability, that um, it should not be considered to be a disability. Um, and in addition, one of the definitions of a disability is a person who has a record of such impairment. Um, and so, you know, if they haven't been diagnosed, you know, for sure with COVID-19, can they declare it, declare it? You know, that's probably, that's a question out there. Um, what's clear, what would be covered under the Fair Housing Act is if a landlord or manager believed or perceived a person to have COVID-19 and denied them housing uh, because they believed that. Um, I don't have an example, clear example of that happening right now. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I guess thankfully old enough to, uh, you know, remember. And I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, so I lost a very close family and friends um, to the AIDS epidemic. Um, and I remember, you know, that was a big issue, uh, and it still is an issue in a lot of housing. I'm sure outside of Los Angeles, for those of you who recall, you may be facing this battle of landlords who don't want to rent to people who they perceive to be HIV positive, or they perceive or they perceive to be ill and not want them to die in the unit or something like that. 
Um, that's clearly coming under the Fair Housing Act. That's clearly illegal. Um, and so I would think that we can extend those same that same rationale to COVID-19 as well. So um, I just wanted to give some examples of, of reasonable accommodations. And, and let me see, I may have skipped a slide, so no, I didn't. So I wanna give some example of reasonable accommodation. So a reasonable accommodation is um, something that a person can ask for, uh, a tenant can ask for, in order to be able to live in and enjoy their rental unit. Um, failure to provide a reasonable com accommodation can be con construed to be disability discrimination. And the housing provider must grant uh, the request reasonable accommodation if it is necessary to accommodate that disability and it doesn't create an undue financial or administrative burden. So as long as those kind of um, uh, those general principles are met, um, then um, the landlord should provide a, a reasonable accommodation if requested. So some of the sample COVID-19 reasonable accommodations that you know I've seen or that have that we've advocated for in the, at, for at the Housing Rights Center. Um, has to do with prohibition of restriction on entry into units. Um, this has come both ways. Mostly we've heard this from tenants who may have compromised um, health um, systems or they're elderly and they don't want anybody, they, they haven't wanted anybody in their unit at all. Um, and they want to be able to kind of proactively let their landlord know that so the landlord doesn't um, try to send somebody there to do an inspection or a repair or even something that's not routine at all. Um, and so that's a, clearly an example of a, of a, of a reasonable accommodation request that, that could be made. Um, in addition, laundry room and facilities. So, you know, we've been getting lots of reports of, this is from both sides. So management companies and, and landlords closing the laundry room facilities, oftentimes with no notice at all, um, saying that they're closing it because they can't maintain um, the, the safety, this is what they, they say, the safety of, of, of the laundry room. But what happens is that means that for persons with disabilities, um, mobility issues or um, seniors, a compromised health um, you know, systems, that, that basically throws them into the public arena by forcing them to go to public laundry mats to wash their laundry, which is you know, obviously not a, a reasonable solution um, for that. So one of the things that we've um, advocated um, and, and, and assisted tenants do in reasonable accommodation requests is, is one, we, we ask that we you know, suggest to the tenants, talk to other tenants in the building. Um, easy, obviously it's easier if you only have a few other residents in the building to kind of get on the same board, maybe come up with a schedule of who goes into the laundry room, who does laundry when. Um, but um, you know, it, you know, try to come up with some type of plan, um, especially if you think that the management's plan is either gonna be no or one that you don't agree with um, and try to you know, introduce that to your management as well. Um, because from the same way, I've also gotten concerns from management companies saying that they um, are concerned or, or maintenance workers about going in, uh, in, into areas as well. That may be an employment issue. Um, so I usually would advise those people to consult with an employment uh, attorney to see if there's a, a workplace um, safety issue there. Um, also, uh, this is clearly a time to request um, a, a service or a companion animal. If, if you believe that um, having that service or companion animal would um, assist you in being able to, um, with your major life activity, and able to enjoy your unit. Um, and as a matter of fact, in Los Angeles, um, they um, uh, have expedited uh, from the animal shelters, the adoptions and so forth, uh, to kind of see it as a win-win, um, but also the recognition a lot of people are lonely, they're isolated, they have anxiety, have stress, clearly um, an animal can help in, um, in those situations. Um, I've already mentioned the cleaning of common areas, the use and type of cleaning chem chemicals. So that's something also that um, I've just started to hear complaints about from tenants where, you know, initially the complaint was that the management wasn't doing enough to clean the common areas. And now the complaint is that people with, um, especially with respiratory issues or with other type of um, issues where exposure to chemicals um, can exacerbate their medical condition or even in some instances cause death. Um, you know, they're complaining that the chemicals, the cleaning chemicals are too strong or, or of a certain chemical um, background or, or um, potency um, that uh, causes an allergic reaction. So um, I, again, I guess the first thing I would suggest is that you, if you can, if you have the ability to consult with a medical provider and so forth to kind of come up with the recommendations to how um, you can formulate your reasonable accommodation request. You know, I, I've seen everything from a, a a request to not use any chemicals at all, and I don't know how I don't know how reasonable that would be given the circumstances of 
of um, the COVID-19 transmission and illness. But you know, I would I would suggest you, you contact your you know get a good assessment of your um, healthcare situation and and what you need, and maybe from there try to go to figuring out how um, you can both reduce your exposure to chemicals while also ensuring the safety um, of, of the residents and yourself from COVID-19 exposure. Uh, another thing ending uh, tenancy early. Um, so the request here that we've seen is where um, like a, a senior was uh, renting an apartment, um, had a caregiver coming to care for them under COVID-19, could no longer have that care caregiver come to take care for them. So they were gonna move in with their family members um, or in the opposite situation. I've had um, young adults say that they were needed to give up their apartment to move in with their parents um, uh, to take care of an elderly family member. Um, clearly that um, um, it, it should be uh, a, a very viable request for a reasonable accommodation, especially if that does not impose an administrative or financial burden on your owner for to allow you to end your lease early or to extend your date if that is also what you need. So know that that's something that you can also ask for um, obviously, having a live-in caregiver or a family member uh, to come and assist during this uh, time, uh, which we're still in, by the way, it may seem as if we're, we're not, but at least in California, we're still under state of em emergency um, in LA County uh, and so forth. So, um, and and even once the state of, of once the orders lift, there's clearly still um, a good cause to continue to be able to ask for a reasonable accommodation or a modification request um, because this uh, this uh, you know there's, there's no vaccination there's there, we're, we're not out of it by any means. Um, so I, it'll it'll continue, I, I believe, or I know that your ability to ask for this request will continue even if your local and state orders have expired. And then also paying rent and maybe enter into a payment plan if you can't, if you've lost your, um, well, it would have to be related to disability. So maybe you've um, something affected your ability um, to earn an income and it's related to a disability, um, you know, it, you know, possibly you can uh, formulate that into a reasonable accommodation request to ask to be able to pay your rent late or to enter into a payment plan or something like that because you could not afford to pay your rent. So um, this is going back to a, a reasonable, that reasonable accommodation request. Um, it is recommended best practice that uh, even if the disability is not readily apparent, this is this is what's recommended as a best practice. This is not necessarily what I'm saying you absolutely have to have, but as a best practice, it is re recommended that you do have some type of proof that the accommodation is medically necessary. Um, and uh, but let me just say that this that documentation of a disability can be provided by a reliable third party, um, such as a caregiver's assessment or somebody knows you well. And during this COVID-19 pandemic, I think that there's even um, an additional uh, rationale or justification for not having um, documented medical uh, medical verification or documentation of the disability and of the person's need for a reasonable accommodation. Because one, you just oftentimes you just can't get it. It's difficult for people to obtain documentation. It's difficult to get doctor's app um, appointments um, and that type of thing, or to allow somebody into your unit to make that assessment. So um, I, I fully advocate that self-certification should be allowed um, and definitely advocate that all housing providers should be flexible in granting uh, reasonable accommodations during these times. So um, just a, a thing, a general thing I kind of throw in other suggestions in terms of uh, your reasonable accommodation or modification a request during COVID-19. And let me take a step to say, I did try to think of a, of a reasonable modification request. I couldn't think of one that, that, is, re that is relevant to COVID-19. But I'd be curious to know. So if anybody wants to add it to the chat or email me separately, if they've come across a situation where an, a reasonable modification, which is usually a, stru a structural change um, usually, to the unit where, where that was necessary uh, for a person who had or believed they had or, or is exposed to or affected by COVID-19. Um, so anyway, um, as I said before, the landlord manager agent should grant it if it's a reasonable request. Um, and uh, that means as well, they should delay non-emergency maintenance and inspection and other non-emergency physical interactions um, as well until the tenant is either no longer vulnerable to COVID-19, there's a vac vaccination or basically until that tenant um, you know, asserts that that um, they no longer need uh, this type of, of assistance. But um, in general, what we're um, communicating to housing providers is that even if the tenants don't specifically ask for uh, the stopping of, of non-emergency maintenance and, and inspections and that type of thing, they should not be doing them during this time. Um, I, it's, to me, that's just clear. 
Social distancing. Um, also, uh, we've done reasonable accommodation requests asking that the land landlord's manager and agents do their part to ensure that other tenants maintain social, social distancing um, to be able to um, access the essential services and to limit the spread of COVID-19. Um, we've um, heard from a lot of tenants who um, are, are fearful and, 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 and they're growing more fearful because they see their other tenants in their building um, having barbecues and things like that um, in the common areas right outside their door, talking in the parking garage or parking lot in, in the laundry room that hasn't been closed um, or the rec room. Um, and so I know that there are a lot of tenants right now who are even more isolated because they're afraid to, to leave their door of their apartment um, because they see all this non all this extreme social um, interaction going on and no social distancing. So that's something else I, I would encourage um, you to think about as a reasonable accommodation request to a landlord. Uh, and that is to, and, and I know this is difficult, this is easier said than done because they're all kind of, you know, uh, First Amendment rights and all this about whether or not a landlord um, can, you know, can tell a tenant who about association or can restrict their ability to, to associate with other tenants. And, and, I, and I recognize that can bring on other fair housing issues, especially if only certain tenants are told that and not other, not other tenants. So in recognition that any of this can bring on a, fair, a potential fair housing violation, I'm going to the matter at hand. I do think that it's reasonable for a tenant to ask the landlord to enforce some type of um, social distancing in common areas, uh, in, in the areas in which they have some control over. So, um, I, you know, just quickly, I want to talk just for a few minutes about California, just so you can see the type of emergency protection that's, um, that was passed or that has been enacted to help pre prevent evictions of tenants during COVID-19. Um, so our California Judicial Council, that's the group that basically tells the courts what to do and that um, administers the court rules. Um, they did adopt emergency uh, rules that prevented all evictions from going forward, except for instances of public health and safety. And there have been a couple of cases where landlords are still filing evictions and going into court saying that the tenant is an extreme nuisance or something like that. Um, but, um, but basically, all or, all or most evictions um, have been stopped except for that, uh, that exception. And then same thing about the tenants, five in, in California, tenants uh, um, have a five day period to file an answer. If they had, if they had an obligation to file an answer, um, you know, that's been basically lifted as well. Um, courts can't file default judgments and there are no court cases um, that are being set right now. And they're gonna be postponed if they were already set. Uh, unfortunately, this in California, this doesn't mean that landlords can't file evictions. It's, uh, you know, we couldn't get the, the judicial council to go or advocates who are trying to get the judicial council to go that far couldn't do that. Um, could, could, but um, so it is. It is a bit confusing. Landlord could start a trial to, um, to file an eviction, but the court won't issue a summons to the tenant, which is uh, for the tenant, which is what's necessary in order for the tenant to be obligated to file an answer to a complaint from lawful detainer. So at least for right now, nothing should be going forward. Uh, because the California uh, law, and we have a, a separate state law as, as well, wasn't as strong um, as tenants advocates wanted, local jurisdictions passed laws that were stronger um, and that provided temporary relief from evictions based on the tenant's non-ability uh, to, uh, to pay rent related to COVID-19. Um, the cities, I won't say, not every city has an order. But each city that does have an order has its different order. So it's really important for you to consult your own city's order, not just your state's order um, or your county's order. Uh, to see what protections there may or may not be for tenants. So for example, in LA City, um, LA City has an, an ordinance where a landlord can't evict the tenant for non-payment of rent due to COVID-19. The tenants have 12 months to pay the back rent after the local emergency has ended. The landlord can't charge interest or late fees during this, this period. Landlords can evict for no fault reasons um, or for having the unauthorized um, tenant or pet violations. That's kind of what I was referring to earlier in the sense of um, uh, this is a, a time definitely that cities should not be um, imposing violations on persons who may have a medical reason for needing their pet um, inside their unit because they can't uh, do other things or they can't take their, 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 their pet um, to some place to a facility to be cared for. And let me just make a quick distinction here. If uh, that animal is medically necessary in order to meet the person's 
uh, dis needs pursuant to their disability, it is not considered a pet. Um, it is basically part of the prescription that they are entitled to. And so no security deposit or anything fees, additional fees should be charged um, for that if, if that animal is medically necessary. And so LA County, um, so just for those of you from LA County, just a couple of days ago, LA County extended their moratorium um, on evictions into June 30th um, because it had expired at the end of May. And it applies to all um, of LA County unincorporated and all LA County cities that don't have uh, stronger moratoriums or that, or that had moratoriums that have already expired or that have moratoriums um, that are about to expire. So even if you're, if you're in LA County um, and your moratorium expired, you, may, you should still be covered and protected from uh, until at least June 30th. So I wanted to share some resources because I know I have people who aren't from California or who aren't from Los Angeles on this call. Um, I have found um, National Low Income Housing Coalition to have one of the best um, resources in, on their website in terms of um, one providing, uh, they have national calls on coronavirus working group, on, uh, on coronavirus and working groups as well. They have people from um, HUD and from uh, different administrations to share what's happening uh, from the federal government's perspective, what's happening on the CARES Act, what's happening on uh, for uh, those for persons with mortgages and who are concerned about foreclosure um, and, and how the CARES Act um, protects um, foreclosure foreclosures or to some degree. Um, also, they have um, uh, detailed discussions about protections for persons who are living in subsidized housing. Um, there there are um, additional protections for, for uh, against eviction for persons who are living in subsidized housing during this time um, as well. And, and so, you know, they're a good resource and they also have a COVID-19 tracker as, as well. Another good resource is the Eviction Lab. Um, the Eviction Lab keep, maintains a COVID-19 housing policy scorecard. Um, so if you go to their website um, and you scroll down from this page, you'll see a link for every state. Um, and, and about the some of the not all of them. I went to the California one, and it was it was it was pretty um, expansive, and, and it rates. Um, and California was was rated pretty low. So um, it's interesting to note that there are other strong states that have stronger eviction protections right now. Uh, than even California does. And as was said earlier, I'm on the board of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Um, uh, the National Fair Housing Alliance, um, one has this, this awesome um, graphic and, and, and really good COVID-19 resources on a national level as well. So I encourage all of you to uh, go to the National Fair Housing Alliance for this resource. Um, in addition, under the, I think it's under the resources link, um, there is another link for um, how to uh, report fair housing complaints in your jurisdiction, and that takes you to fair housing organizations that uh, hopefully are located in your jurisdiction. So um, uh, the fair housing, the National Fair Housing Alliance will assist you in being able to find your local fair housing council uh, that will um, help you enforce the, all the rights that I've discussed. Yeah, this is um, in, in the Housing Rights Center in Southern California. Um, we also are maintaining COVID-19 resources, including a COVID-19 tenant protection track, tracker, where for each city, um, and there are over 30 cities uh, within LA County, we have um, a synopsis of their eviction moratoriums uh, or, or protections. Many of them aren't flat out moratoriums. We're just using that term generally because they're not about banning evictions, but they have some type of restriction on them. So anyway, uh, at the housingrightscenter.org's uh, website, we have uh, information on every city, a link to their protection. And then we also have sample letters uh, for sample COVID-19 reasonable accommodation letters that a tenant can use if they need a reasonable accommodation request. Uh, and I'm, I believe, um, well, yeah. Um, so just, Really quickly, because I want to kind of introduce the, the issue of mental health um, as, 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 as Dr. Roberts prepares for her presentation. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. When I was first writing this, I, I really was kind of free thinking um, because the one thing about this pandemic is that all of us um, have probably experienced in either our or within our household um, some type of, of mental health issue that we may not have had or recognize we've had, but this has caused extreme isolation, um, parenting crisis issues, domestic violence within the households. 
children and teenager uh, mental health um, issues, especially if they no longer have their support groups um, that they're, you know, that they're basically at home with maybe the same parent that, that caused um, all of their issues. There's um, child abuse and senior abuse um, that's going on. Um, lots of um, you know, reports on, on LGBTQ isolation. You know, in particular, member of the, those of that community were may have already faced extreme isolation and family I, um, I, um, isolation if, if they were ostracized from their family or and or from friends. Um, many LGBTQ seniors live alone. Um, and there are health disparities as well, especially if they are Black or Latino and low income, um, may have been denied access to health care, may have had issues that were not diagnosed, or we just were not listened to or addressed. Um, and so clearly that can bring on additional um, issues, mental health issues, and what I call the racial impact of the COVID-19 blame game. Um, and, and, and that is something I... Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, there's, well, there was my picture in the beginning. I'm, I'm black. I'm, I'm African American. Um, and so, and even, and, and even if I weren't, I, I would think I'd still really see all of the media and the press and so forth about how COVID-19 um, is adversely and overly impacting um, black, the black community. And it is. I'm not by no means. I'm not um, saying that it, that it's not uh, by any means. And there are reasons for it. But there's something about being told every single day that you're on you, you're on the verge of dying, <laughs> and that you 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 your vulnerability to death is is the reason why other people have to wear masks and can't go out and party and so forth. Um, that 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 can become draining after a while, <laughs> and so forth. So. You know, I, I think I, I encourage everybody to you know, go go to whatever resource you can. Um, you know, talk to others as well. And you know, and even some there been there's been some really good um, materials and resources out there as well. Um, so, in, and just in my kind of search for for resources, I gain control of my mouse again. Um, go back, and you know, there's um, you know. Um, Dr. Um, um, Kendi, Dr. Kendi, I'm actually not sure if he's a, uh, uh, a doctor or not, but um, he has written very good articles on basically entitled, you know, stop blaming black people for uh, for COVID-19 or, you know, from dying for it or for, you know, the vulnerabilities of it and, and as well. And in addition, um, that even uh, those, not just the fear of getting the illness can cause um, extreme mental health issues, um, but, you know, taking care of others as well, being you know, very overly concerned for elderly family members um, and family members who are vulnerable because, you know, oftentimes if you're um, are Black or Latino or, or in the Native communities, they've also been really heavily impacted by the COVID-19 um, um, illness. It's oftentimes because of pre-existing um, health uh, uh, conditions. And I just want to say something really quickly about that. That's, this is not part of this training. It, this is part of another webinar training series. But um, since this is fair housing, uh, you know, there's a reason why um, Black, Latino, Native communities are more heavily impacted by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You know, it goes all the way back, really back to slavery. Um, go actually before that, going back to where, um, you know, we were through displacement um, and where we were told places we were um, made to live, places without good infrastructure, clean water, um, access to uh, housing through redlining and so forth. Our neighborhoods were deprived of investments and of the opportunity to improve our communities. Um, we were denied healthcare, um, hospitals, and facilities. They were often the, the last ones to be open and the first ones to close. Um, to close, many um, states uh, denied the uh, Affordable Care Act, and uh, otherwise known as Obamacare, in their communities that happened to also be heavily Black and Latino um, that could have benefited from those healthcare benefits. Um, the, there's a whole there's a whole myriad thing. Not not being properly ex diagnosed uh, for healthcare and so forth. So there there are a lot of reasons that aren't our aren't the fault of persons who are being affected by COVID-19 as to why they are vulnerable from this illness. And many of these go back to um, the, the atrocities of racism um, and the original and still the ongoing sin of this country, and that's slavery and, and the enslavement of Black people. Uh, the Mental Health, uh, Mental Health Amer America, they're at their website. Um, they also have, met, um, and if you scroll down, this is just a quick synopsis. They have many resources, so I suggest you go to those as well. And this is a couple more, uh, Coronavirus and Latino Health Equity. Um, the American Medical um, Association has a lot of resources, um, and, and it goes into resources for different communities as well, and then from LGBTQ, Native communities, Black communities as well. So I suggest you go to that. And just a little bit of us, if you please, if you know, feel free to contact the Housing Rights Center. 
website if you want to have more information. And I thank you so much for indulging me um, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor, for a great presentation. Let's move on to uh, Dr. Roberts. Take it away, Dr. Roberts. Okay. All right, thank you all for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, like Chancellor, I am here in Los Angeles County. Um, today, I'm going to focus on uh, mental health issues that can be exacerbated during stressful times like COVID-19. Um, I'm also going to talk about coping mechanisms that can be helpful to use during this time or any times that are really stressful, um, as well as um, give some national resources uh, for folks to be able to use. And that'll be handed out to you all as well. Um, I do want to take a few moments, though, um, and, and like Chancellor, to acknowledge the more recent events um, in our nation that are just as stressful, or if, if not more so, because they've been going on for far too long. Um, the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and countless other Black and African Americans um, at the hands of police is an epidemic in and of itself. Um, and, and it's been going on, you know, in the United States for centuries. In that same vein, uh, systemic institutional racism is a part of that same epidemic. So we can't talk about fair housing without acknowledging this um, and the effect that it has on thousands upon thousands of people of color um, in our country. Um, becoming culturally aware, having discussions, educating ourselves and others is an ongoing process, um, certainly. Um, but we're also in a time where action needs to be taken. Um, today, specifically, I'm talking about ways that people can cope during stressful times, uh, and I certainly hope that the stress and pressure that's being put on our leaders um, will start to enact some real change. Um, stress can wear you down. Um, it can have uh, an, a major emotional and physical weight, um, but it can also shore people up and you can find a strength that you, you didn't know that you had. So Chancellor mentioned some uh, issues that are definitely being exacerbated uh, by COVID-19 or just by stress in our lives in general. Um, some of the ones that we've noticed um, here in the Department of Mental Health um, for LA County uh, are, are anxiety, depression, um, the use of substances, um, people not being able to go to their NA meetings and AA meetings, things like that. Um, eating disorders as well. Um, I know that we all have seen the news in terms of intimate partner violence and the rise in that. Um, during, uh, you know, quarantine and isolation orders, um, and then just general conflict with family and friends um, or your neighbors. Uh, it's really important to recognize what, you know, what current stressors are for ourselves and for those of us around uh, and for the, the people that are around us. Uh, and Chancellor mentioned some of these as well too, but being ill or, or having a sick, uh, a sick loved one, you know, being a caretaker, the loss of loved ones, we've lost thousands of people um, in the United States to COVID-19. And that's had a tremendous impact on people, especially the inability to have funerals and have services for folks. Um, as Chancellor mentioned as well too, some of these orders in, in different states have been lifted already or, or are in the process of being lifted, but nevertheless, there has been a loss of our normal routine for a lot of people, not being able to see family and friends, um, children not being at school or in their normal childcare that they might be in, uh, and certainly a huge impact in the loss of jobs and financial concerns as well. And those are just some of the stressors that people are dealing with. Okay, so I'm going to mention just a couple of coping skills. There's a lot of things out there, um, but given um, my time frame here, I'm going to kind of go through these, and these are just some that are really helpful, not just to our consumers, um, to landlords or tenants, um, to patients or clients. Th these are coping skills that all of us can use at any time, and they're very helpful, and I can't emphasize enough the coping skill of breathing. Uh, it seems really simple, um, but I would even encourage you all right now, there's, there's a lot of you, um, on this webinar, if everybody took a moment to take a nice deep inhale through your nose and a nice exhale, um, breathing is, is extremely important and can, and can really uh, help in, in coping and lowering stress levels. Um, meditation as well, there, there's a plethora of online um, guided meditations that can be found for free, um, so it's very, very helpful. Um, 
obviously having somebody to talk to. Uh, we've had to physically distance ourselves from people, um, but I know our executive management has not been uh, fond of the word social distancing. Um, it's more of a physical distancing that we're, we're doing, but we can still reach out to people. We can reach out to our family members, to friends, a therapist, if you have a therapist, a crisis counselor. Um, and there's even warm lines that you can call. So there are lines that you can call where you can talk to somebody, even if you're not in crisis, just to be able to reach out and talk to somebody is important. Um, some of the skills I focused on um, come from dialectical behavior therapy. This is something I've practiced um, for many years with clients. It's an evidence-based practice. It helps to provide skills uh, for practicing mindfulness, which I'm going to talk more about, um, interacting with others effectively, and regulating our emotions, and particularly dealing with, uh, with major distress that we're dealing with. One of the key components to DBT is mindfulness learning to be in the moment, um, aware of your surroundings around you in a non-judgmental way, just being in the moment where you are, um, and radically accepting um, you know, what's in that moment. There are things that we cannot change. The dialectical piece of DBT is about an integration of opposites. So it's sort of bringing together a balance of acceptance for the things that you know, we can't have an effect on or can't change, as well as the things that we are able to change. So it's sort of bringing those two, bridging those two things together. Mindfulness can also help you take a moment before you're reacting to someone or something in your environment in a negative way. Using the mindfulness skills helps you kind of just stop for a minute, even just for a couple of seconds before you say that thing you can't take back or do something that you're not able to take back either. Um, some of the what mindfulness looks like it's easy to talk about it and it sounds pretty simple but this kind of breaks it down a little bit more about what it looks like and how you would do it you're you're really observing your your current surroundings wherever you are whether you're at work you're at home um you're uh, sitting in your car waiting to pick up your kid whatever the case may be um you're really describing what's around you just just the facts just what's actually happening in your environment the participation piece has more to do with whether or not you're going to actively participate in what what is going on. I worked for many years with adolescents, so the best way I describe this is, is going to a party and you're observing and describing what's going on at that party, but then you're making a conscious choice on whether or not you're going to actively participate and that's part of mindfulness. Um, what's really important is the focusing on one thing. We are a culture of multitasking um, and, and that's sort of held up as a, as a positive, um, but mindfulness really helps us to take a step back and really just focus on one thing at a time. This has been very difficult, I think, for a lot of us to do given COVID-19 um, and, and all the, just the things happening in the news in general, both here in the United States and around the world. It's been very hard to stay focused. Um, we've done a lot of webinars, a lot of Zoom meetings. It's hard to stay focused on those. It's easy to answer emails and text on your phone while also trying to participate in a webinar. So <laughs> mindfulness is really about just being in the moment and focusing on one thing and doing that effectively with, with purpose. And again, I can't stress enough the non-judgmental um, part, just really observing what's actually going on and happening. So here's some additional um, coping skills that are particularly helpful. There's activities, of course. Uh, we've seen lots of people uh, that have been um, showcasing their exercise routines on YouTube and Instagram and, <laughs> and everywhere else, uh, but exercise is really important. Uh, workbooks and puzzles, coloring, uh, writing or journaling, um, being able to read. Uh, I know a lot of people have been using uh, Netflix and HBO and all those things to watch movies and television. Um, participating in games with our family and friends. There's a lot of things um, that you can do, uh, both physically distancing while still playing games with people that are in other households, or for those that you are living with, playing some board games. Um, another helpful one is contributing and helping others. A lot of stress comes from not feeling in control, feeling helpless. And sometimes it's really helpful to be able to reach out and help in any way that you can help, whether it's donating your time, your money, uh, just helping those in your immediate environment, um, just taking the time to contribute um, and reach out can kind of help you, uh, you know, gain back a sense of that control and, and, and be able to um, not feel as helpless in the moment. Uh, and obviously praying and meditating as well. 
One of the other things DBT stresses too is that for particularly distressful moments or thoughts that are running through our head, it's okay to push those away uh, for the moment and sort of distract yourself with an activity. Uh, we don't, it, you know, not everything has to be uh, dealt with right there in the moment. If it's really, really stressful and it, it's causing a lot of emotional distress, you can kind of push that away and engage in an activity that's uh, helpful to you or even utilizing imagery, right? A nice memory from a past, uh, just a beautiful landscape, a place that you've been, or something that you might want to do in the future, uh, like going on a vacation or being with family members. Balancing emotions also means being aware of what we're eating, how we're sleeping, um, how we're moving, right? Exercise and just generally how you're phys feeling physically. All of those things play a part and how we feel on our how, how we feel emotionally on a regular basis. Uh, we wouldn't have the word hangry if that wasn't the case, right? So it's really important that you're um, being very aware. A lot of these things um, got impacted with having to stay inside and not being able to go out to restaurants or engage. Um, so we saw a lot of our eating habits change. Our sleeping became uh, disruptive. A lot of us weren't getting out, uh, maybe and exercising as much as we weren't we were um, because gyms were closed. So these are really important things to think about. Another thing um, I like to point out too that I think is helpful is being aware of what emotion you're truly experiencing can help you when you're interacting with others. Um, an example of this is sometimes when people lash out at another person, um, it's really coming from an emotion of fear rather than anger. Um, a classic example is for anybody that's a parent that's on the line, right? Have you ever uh, snapped at your kid or yelled at your kid because you got scared? Um, they were getting ready to fall or touch the hot stove or something. Um, and really you, you reacted um, because of fear, not because you were angry with them. Um, so it's really important to kind of tap into those, um, those emotions that you're really feeling. Um, a more specific one um, that I, I wanted to mention before I got to the resources here um, is also recognizing and even validating the emotions of other people around us and what they're going through. This is really important. Validation isn't about, you don't have to agree with somebody. It's not about agreeing with somebody or condoning um, their behavior or their stance. It's, it's simply having an understanding uh, of where they're coming from and letting somebody else know that you, you've heard them. Um, and it can be tremendously helpful. Uh, in DBT, they, we talk about interpersonal effectiveness. This is how we interact with not just our family members and our friends, but our coworkers or even strangers. Um, one of the particular skills of which there are many uh, is one that we call give. Um, and this is just kind of a skill that breaks down how you can approach somebody during a particularly stressful moment. Um, and you can start by doing it gently, right? Sort of lowering your voice um, and, and just sort of approaching what's going on in a gentle manner. Being actually genuinely interested in what somebody else has to say, um, instead of being prepared for what you're going to say or how you're going to react, um, really taking the time to to really hear them out and hear what they have to say and being genuinely interested in that. Again, validating is acknowledging and accepting that that is what that other person is thinking and feeling. Again, you don't have to agree with it. It's just validating that that's where they're at um, and approaching it again with an easy manner, right? Staying calm, staying easy. Um, that can be really helpful when interacting with others, especially during you know particularly stressful times. Um, some of the resources I included, there's a one page um, that I think you're all going to be given, um, but they're, they're also here on the slide. I did include uh, for LA County, for anybody that's here in Southern California and in LA County in particular, we have an access line um, as well, uh, which is a 24-hour line where you can get uh, mental health support resources and referrals. There's also a web page there. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, I've given this to every client I've ever worked with. Um, it's a great resource. It isn't just for those that are feeling um, suicidal. It's also a crisis line. So people can reach out and talk to trained counselors across the United States. Um, it's very, very uh, uh, helpful. I can't, I can't raise this one up enough. And I actually worked for the National Suicide uh, Prevention Lifeline for a period of time. It's a very, very helpful resource. Um, the Friendship Line is for older adults. Uh, for both crisis, um, you know, intervention, as well as a warm line for non-emergency stuff. Uh, there's a teen peer line that's also a national number. 
I've included the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration as a national helpline. Um, this is particularly helpful for folks that are looking for resources, especially during COVID-19. Uh, you know, what which NA and AA groups might be open, how you can get connected. This is an excellent resource. Um, and here's some additional ones in terms of focusing on uh, the National Eating Disorder Association, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which has been utilized quite a bit. And unfortunately, numbers for this hotline uh, went up in these last couple of months. Um, the other resource that I provided is an, is an actual workbook. It's the Coronavirus Anxiety Workbook provided by the Wellness Society. It's a free workbook that they created. It's got a lot of really helpful tools for helping to manage anxiety. Uh, you don't have to do the workbook. You can do it in any order or any pieces of it. Um, I just uh, We discovered it, and it's just uh, a really, really helpful resource that might be um, of use for people. And then there's additional resources here at Behavioral Tech. Uh, dot org for um, dialectical behavior therapy for anybody that wants to know a little bit more about it uh, or about the additional skills. There's many more skills than the ones that I covered uh, today in this presentation. Um, but that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nelson, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we do have questions. Uh, so we'll just do a couple of them since we are at the top of the hour. Uh, Chancellor, someone is asking, um, it, it's about a tenant and a family who uh, had COVID, the family members had COVID, and they're not being allowed to use the laundry facilities anymore. They've been under self-quarantine, uh, and the tenants say that uh, the doctor has cleared them, but the manager says that he or she has to have a verification of being cleared of COVID before they can start using the laundry facilities again. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so this is Chancellor from the Housing Rights Center. I would think that that's unreasonable just given what is known um, and so forth about COVID, um, especially if they had a, some type of medical verification saying that they were no longer in infected or, and, and I don't really know, know what that means. I have to, I have to confess in terms of um, what, what that doctor's note would, would say or if it would suggest it, because I don't know how much is known. So. Uh, Unfortunately, I think because there's so much unknown that this I, I, I can see the situation happening over and over again. I would just su suggest that the tenants try to get a medical verification that they no longer, uh, you know, you know, impose any type of a, of a safety issue and give that to their landlord and put it in the frame, even though it's kind of weird, of a reasonable accommodation request that they're no longer, um, or, you know, even without it being a reasonable accommodation request, just put it in the form and, and make it a legal matter and force them to risk consult with an attorney because they're being denied a service that they pay for. Great, thank you. Another question asks, um, this is, um, if non, this is, if non-essential construction is being done in a private home where the tenant shares common space with a landlord or the owner, can the tenant request a reasonable accommodation uh, and, and request that the construction stop? For example, construction in the laundry area again. So I've had that similar thing come up where there's construction going on and ten, yeah, and, and and it's a roommate type situation. So the quick answer is yes, you can always request it. <laughs> um, again, the landlord can deem it to be too much of a burden, either administratively or, or financially or, or even kind of conceptually. And so that may be the response back that it, it's too much of a burden, but the tenant can always ask. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another one, um, if, would it be a reasonable accommodation if, if a resident needs some kind of physical barrier removed or physical improvement due to reduced mobility because of COVID? Perhaps they're using a cane now and they weren't before or a walker. So in general, um, if the tenant has some type of verification saying that they need to have that barrier removed, they can formulate that, put that into a reasonable accommodation request. Um, they should know that they uh, probably will be responsible for the for whatever the cost is to remove that barrier, if it's possible to remove it. And they also may be responsible for paying for putting it back into its original position if they move out, um, because the landlords are, unless it's subsidized, how government subsidized housing, usually a landlord's not required to pay for that reasonable modification. Uh, another question here. For folks who are running supportive housing with case management services, 
can we require clients to wear masks during one-on-one -on -one sessions if the agency provides them? So that sounds like that could be a bit of a, an employment question also, because it's coming from case managers. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of these, I, I'm already seeing, uh, there are like employment issues also, you know, when they're coming from staff of, um, and as well. So, you know, I, I would just, con I would just go to either the CDC or other, your county met, um, met, um, guidelines. I'm sure there's a county health department that has issued some guidelines in terms of what's required in terms of masks. Um, I know in Los Angeles County, it, it, our county has determined what what's required in terms of wearing masks in public and in offices and so forth. And not inside inside an office, but you, you, there could be county uh, guidance in this. Excellent. Well, being it that we're five past the hour, um, that that will be it for now. And, and uh, if there are a couple of other questions that trickle in, I'll send them to to you or the Dr. Chancala for answering later. Great. Well, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your uh, questions. Once again, I would like to uh, give a special thanks to our great uh, guest speaker for those uh, fantastic presentations. I also would like to thank you for joining us today. Be sure to mark your calendar for our upcoming webinars on July 15th and August 5th. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And in the interim, please stay safe and we'll see you next month. Goodbye.